if you over control the situation it just you know you're taking the heart and soul out of it so i think to some degree what you're really doing is you're you know you're trying to make sure that you've got yourself covered as far as anything sort of falling through the bottom but yeah the whole thing is a creative process from beginning to end and i don't want to leave any opportunities for something great to happen out Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. Today's episode of Recording Studio Rockstars is sponsored by Roswell Pro Audio, maker of handcrafted microphones in California. Inspired design and impeccable attention to detail will help you capture a gorgeous vintage sound without the vintage price tag. Check out their beautiful line of microphones at roswellproaudio.com. Sending your music to be mastered can be scary, but sending your music to a total stranger for mastering can be really scary. Chris Graham is a Billboard chart-breaking mastering engineer with thousands of credits and knows how to make your record sound fantastic. But more importantly, he understands that there is one person that really knows what a great record sounds like, and that's you, rock stars. So if you're thinking about hiring professional mastering, but not sure if it's right for you, go to chrisgrammastering.com and get a free sample mastering of your song. Go find out just how great your record can sound at chrisgrammastering.com. Just click the link included in the show notes. Hey, Rockstars, it's your host, Lid Shaw, and welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars, bringing you into the studio to learn from recording professionals so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is Ted Hutt a Grammy Award-winning British music producer, musician, and songwriter living in Los Angeles, California. Ted was originally a guitar player and founding member of The Promise, The Great Unwashed, God's Hotel, Reach Around, and Flogging Molly. He moved on to production from there and is credited with many chart-breaking albums, including the Gaslight Anthem, Flogging Molly, including their RIAA certified gold recording, Drunken Lullabies, and its follow-up Within a Mile of Home, The Bouncing Souls, Lucero, Dropkick Murphys, Old Crow Medicine Show, and Audra May, amongst other notable artists. And I want to give a big shout out and a thank you to Brad Wood for making the introduction to Ted. I look forward to digging into some awesome questions today about recording slamming Irish music, among other things, on the show today. So please welcome Ted Hutt to Recording Studio Rockstars. Ted, are you ready to rock, man? I think so, yeah. Is is that what you guys do when you're recording this kind of slamming Irish stuff? Is it is it considered rocking or is it cons- do you refer to it as something else? Well, we all sit around and drink tea and eat biscuits to get get our vibe going. <laughs> <laughs> How, and, then we like just... <laughs> and you plot you and, plot and scheme against the, the upcoming recording scheme. session. It, Something like that, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, it's, it's, it's fueled by a lot of PG tips and berries, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> These well, days, anyway. Well, so Rockstars, uh, uh, Ted has kindly, he's joining us from across the country on a, on a Skype over an iPhone, so you may hear him in the act of looking for some power in the middle of the, the interview. Yeah, but I, it's, I just, just realized, I've got the headphones plugged in, and there isn't another plug in the phone for the power. And oh, that's, that's I'm hilarious. Kind of, <laughs> well, you that's, know, that's like, how live we are. That's how rock and roll we are here at Recording there Studio There we go. Rock so we're stars. winging it. We'll, we're we'll, winging if it. we lose it, we'll, we'll, click, we'll, we'll charge it all back and start again. Listen, so, we, think, can't, we can't always talk on the podcast about how it's all about the performance and not the technology and then not just like <laughs> live that at the same time, you know? Yeah. The technology's also always got me in a stranglehold. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's have, I like to credit our guests for being the first time to say something on the podcast, and that's the first time somebody said stranglehold in over a hundred and <laughs> however many episodes. So. I like the song. I don't like the artist. Excellent. <laughs> well, so, Ted, um, I've given a brief introduction. Fill in the gaps for us. Tell us a little more about who you are and how you got into all this. Into this interview? No, that was no. Brad. Yeah, not the interview, <laughs> but uh, into recording music. I, I listened to Brad's interview. That was a really good one. Thank I, you. I hope I can. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I can do that one justice. Well, we're off to a um, good start already. So, how did we get into this? I'd, um, wow, 
uh, I guess that goes all the way back to sort of picking up a first guitar, really, or, or watching, you know, watching somebody on a TV screen. That I, I don't know. I don't know what what point I really made that connection, but it it sort of it made its connection, and um, and it was just you know something that had to be done from that point onwards, you know. Um, mm-hmm. And then I guess it's you know it's some to some degree it's just sort of following a path you know it's like it's sort of follow putting one foot in front of another into you know in a way that felt like it was the right you know it was the right thing to do. Uh, um, where were you growing up? I grew up in South London, so I was you know I mean I, I felt like I was I was in a good place as far as a lot of sort of inspirational music. You know, I grew up listening to a lot of music. I grew up listening to a lot of Irish standards and stuff. My father was Irish, so mm-hmm. and my family, I think mean, half of my family kind of originated from there. So I, um, you know, I think that was also an interesting sort of, when I think back and look back on that, I think that was a, that was maybe the start of sort of opening the gate and looking out beyond the world of pop music, you know, but beyond the world of what you would hear on the radio and the things that you were sort of like, you would come into contact with ease. It was that idea of sort of digging underneath the surface and finding out sort of more about the cultural elements of music and, and the things that were sort of things that, you know, people, I suppose, had a different sort of place in people's lives it, it was sort of something more integral well so you were growing up and you're exposed to music coming over the radio um what was the music scene like and what sort of bands were you hearing and getting excited about and then you're saying that you kind of rediscovered the traditional side of, of irish music through your dad and as you were as you're growing up in this yeah i mean i think Early on, it was all about a guitar. You know, I, I loved playing guitar, and I think that was, you know, I, I loved anything that had a loud guitar in it. So, so, so electric. The, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I suppose, you know, that was a, you know, there was a transformation there too. That you know, I had to sort of put away the noisy electric guitar and sort of discover more of the acoustic instruments, which is, you know, which is interestingly enough something that I've, you know, worked I've worked a lot in that world with 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 acoustic instruments and. You know, as somebody that started out listening to, you know, Marshall, Marshall amps and, you know, Les Pauls and stuff that sort of blew your head back. It was, a, you know, that was a change there. Well, so what were some of the bands before you rediscovered the acoustic world? What were some of the bands that you were growing well, I would, up? I would say, you know, a lot of the obvious ones, you know, the, the Clash, the Sex Pistols, anything that, you know, I, I, I liked the old. I liked a lot of the sort of dress up music, too. I liked a lot of the early you know, and even going back further, the, the, the sort of glam rock era, the T, you know, T Rex, yeah, and um, and and even even the sort of more poppy stuff, Slade and stuff like that, the sort of real guttural, you know, put your hands in the air and sort of just let it all out sort of music, um, which I guess sort of came full circle. You know, interestingly enough, you know, I've had this co- conversation with the couple of the guys from Dropkick Murphys, because I think, interestingly enough, there's sort of a, a marriage of those elements there, right there. So you sort of sit, you know, at one point, I think I'm sitting there working on a record with those with, with the Dropkicks guys, and it's sort of like, you know, how you get to play with the influences from that world and sort of mix them also with the influences from sort of further down the road when you discovered sort of more you know, more, more of the classic and more of the acoustic instrumentation of, of Irish music. Yeah, totally. That actually leads me into the question I wanted to ask you. So when I was writing the intro, I, I started to write a line saying something like, you know, making slamming Irish music without an electric guitar. And then I thought, well, wait a minute. And I went back and I listened yeah. again. I was like, there's electric guitar and everything. In fact, Old Crow Medicine Show is one of the only places I didn't hear an electric guitar right away. And so I wanted to ask you about that. What you know, talk about introducing electric guitar into traditional, or was it the other way around? I guess you're describing it was sort of like electric first, and then introducing the traditional stuff. Yeah, and I, I suppose in a way that you know that was the I, very early on. I was in a band called Flogging Molly, and I think you know that was the similar sort of situation where we would use electric guitar. I don't know if there was a lot of thought in that other than it was, you know, if we were going to play a show, it needed to be a bit louder. Right. And so there was that. But funnily enough, you know, I think if you go through some of the dropkick stuff, there are tracks in there and, and some of the tracks that are real special to me too, which, which aren't so electric. You know, there was a track that we did called Rose Tattoo, which was, 
which was mostly uh, was mostly acoustic. And I think you know it, it, it's a challenge again, you know, as it as it has been, you know, working with the Old Crow guys, is that you want to be able to make something punch and sort of have that energy and spirit, even though it doesn't have electric instruments. And I think there's a challenge there, and 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 hopefully it's a challenge that we've sort of risen to a couple of times along the way. Yeah, definitely. I definitely want to dig into some deeper questions with you about recording that way and and having powerful music because. I'd say across the board, listening to your discography, I would describe most of it as powerful, or at least many of the things I heard. Do you feel like you've been drawn towards music that's powerful, or do you, I'm probably just not even paying attention to what I just said about your discography, but how about ballads and, and things like that? What, what, how does that balance out in your discography? I think there's, I mean, from my perspective, there's a fair balance. And I think that that's something that's always in evolution, too. I mean, there's so many things that I like musically. And I'm drawing from so many sort of inspirations that, you know, the way I would look at it is, you know, hopefully the discography is just an unfolding thing. And you know, and there's room for all sorts of different aspects and different turns along the way. I think there's an interesting point there, though, in maybe it's more energy than power. Right. That I that I you know, I think it's sort of coming from that world of playing live music and, and that sort of interaction with an audience and and I you know, it's something that's just personal to me, I suppose. I like that energy. I like the idea, you know, when you hit the studio, for me it's more about trying to create you know, I think early on I figured I wanna go in there with, with with the band. If it is a band situation and that's what they do, I wanna be able to go in there and sort of create their best gig right you know the best gig that they can do in you know in that album cycle so that when you listen to it it sounds like a bunch of guys that are just like having the best gig you know on the tour i was just imagining that you know energetic music it's music that it doesn't uh match up well with an empty room you know (laughs) you kind of have to i've been in a couple of those situations though i have to tell you (laughs) you still got to deliver but i was also thinking as i thought that thought that um we're also talking about uh pretty big bands so flogging molly came into my studio at bonnaroo here years ago and is a large band you know and I imagine that that's part of it. Maybe when you've got a really big band, if the room's a little bit empty, at least there's enough of you on stage to keep the energy <laughs> To up. keep each other <laughs> occupied. Yeah. You keep each other amused. Yeah. Well, yeah. so talk about going into studios for the first time and sort of introducing yourself to the recording process. Well, my first, my first studio experience was with, you know, I was 17, I think, at the time, and it was with a producer called Mickey Most, who had been sort of a you know, it, he'd been a big pop producer and, and I think he, it maybe was even him that coined the phrase bubblegum, you know, for pop music. And yeah, and I, I mean, it was ter- I was terrifying to me. It was like this, you know, real sort of alien space that, that sort of seemed like, you know, nothing I'd ever set foot in before. And there was a, I remember there was a control room that was sort of up in the ceiling and it looked down on you as you were playing. Right, like Abbey Road or something. Yeah. And um, it was, it was a mixture of sort of, you know, just uh, a mixture of every feeling really. It was sort of something that I would, you know, I'd really strived to get to that place. And, and it was, and it felt like a great accomplishment to be standing there making music in that environment. But yet again, it also felt very sort of alien. So I don't know. I think maybe that was something that along the way sort of, prompted the idea of figuring out, trying to figure out more natural recording situations for projects as as I became a producer myself. Interesting, yeah. So the experience being, um, I don't know, uh, just feeling invasive of your music making process guided you towards wanting to produce sessions where it, it feels more transparent? Yeah, I think so. And, and I think as I went along, you know, I was a guitar player in various bands. And, and I think as I as I were, and I was very fortunate to work with some great producers, and I, and I think that was a, you know, that was a very interesting period, sort of seeing all the different ways, you know, that that it, that you could record stuff stuff from from the sort of very very basic guerrilla style recording. I, I remember we had a producer called Steve Lipson. Very very early on, he would come to our house in South London, and he would bring you know a couple of four track recorders and link them together and he would record us at various places around the house. And that seemed sort of more fun to me 
maybe it was just the, the it felt less it felt sort of that, that there was less pressure and more creativity in that situation so i think you know it was a i think a process of trying to figure out how to get that feeling into you know even when you're in the bigger rooms try to get that sort of vibe going on yeah I, i've always been a big fan of uh, what I would also call guerrilla recording techniques, you know, setting up studios in unexpected places yeah. and, and recording that I don't way. think that happens enough. I mean, I had a conversation with somebody about that the other day. I mean, you know, there seems to be a time back back a while ago when people would sort of rent old houses and sort of, you know, right. just go places that would, I think that, that, that always seems so much fun to me. And it seems like nowadays that seems like something that would be easier to do than it would have been in the, in those days, you know. So what do you feel like you see now? People just going into studios more? Or do you think that everybody's already got a studio at home so they're not renting a place to set up as a studio? Well, that's becoming, yeah. I mean, you know, it's a very it's a very changing time, isn't it? And I think, you know, studios seem like, you know, there's a lot of records that people are having to make just sort of financially in in sort of in their houses or with their, you know, with their computer systems or whatever but I don't think it's the same thing. It's not sort of doing it to, you know, to create a vibe and have an event and all the rest. It's more just out of necessity that they're having to do that. Yeah, and it's tricky because while a home studio is exciting and can feel gorilla in some aspects, I think one of the challenges is uh, there are some things about being home you don't want in your studio. Like you don't want to be playing music and be thinking about an unpaid bill that you see out of the corner of your eye, you know, that sort of thing. <laughs> Or, yeah, or unwashed reckon, dishes. If you're going to be making music, you better be think. You better learn how to deal with those unpaid bills. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you need to learn no, how to I let think, go. Yeah, I think no. I think they're a different thing. I think you know the idea of sort of like I, there's something romantic to me about sort of finding an old building or something. Something and n- not there's not a romantic feeling about doing it at home out of, nece- out of necessity, although, you know, that can be, that can be great too. But I think the idea of sort of creating an event, you know, you, you're putting everything together. And I think the part of it that isn't the technical side of it is just as important. It's the, it's the building up of the enthusiasm for the artist and the, you know, and, and everybody involved with the project. So, sort of, you know, it, it's a great feeling to sort of fly yourself to this destination and then you sort of, you're all together discovering the city and the musical history of the city. I just recently did a record in New Orleans, which was really, you know, that was really fun because you absorb all of it, you know, the, the food, the culture, the music, the weather, all of it. And I think it all has a bearing and, and it all has an effect on the end result. Uh, that's very cool. So um, what can you share about, some of the musical stuff that got absorbed into the session. Did you literally like find a, a funeral brass band going down the street and pull them into the studio or, you know, what were some ways that the music of New Orleans just came right into we, your session? Well, we really literally did. We, we went to see Preservation Hall jazz band and then we had, you know, then they came to the studio and recorded on the record. So. Nice. Well, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> Straight and to they the were source. fantastic. And it was fantastic. And, and there, there are those moments where, you know, it's such a rewarding feeling doing this where you, you sort of stand amidst that and, and you and you feel like you're you're witnessing something. There are certain artists where they're the only ones in the world that can do that kind of thing, you know, and you and you bear witness to it and it's it's a wonderful feeling. Um what what studio were you guys recording at? We recorded at a studio called The Parlor. Oh cool. I d I don't know that one. I guess I wouldn't know all the studios down there, but I remember Kingsway was Daniel Lenoir's studio at one point. Yeah. I don't know if that still exists in any form or not. Um, I don't know about the, the parlor's a new place, um, and it, I would recommend it. It's great. Cool, cool. Well, so that made me want to segue to, uh, you know, you're talking about setting up shop in places and, and um, working out of location, a new location as a studio. And it reminded me of two things. One is I noticed you had worked at the Magic Shop in New York, and I know... Kevin Killen had, uh, when I had him on the show, he talked about working at the Magic Shop and doing um, Black Star for David Bowie there as well. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, but I also know Kevin Killen is somebody who, with Daniel Lenoir tying all the line, you know, points together here, <laughs> yeah. that those guys would have done that. They would have gone and, you know, recorded in a castle, for example. What are some places that you've, uh, some other places where you've set up a guerrilla studio and really enjoyed it in your career? 
Well, I, I don't know so much about setting up the Gorilla Studio, but definitely some of the locations. I mean, that's one of them. I mean, being in being in Magic Shop, which I believe isn't there anymore now, unfortunately. Oh, um, no, I, I didn't realize that. I may be wrong, but I, I thought I heard that. But, I, you know, yeah, that's a fantastic environment there. You know, um, I just recently returned from... Um, from Ireland, where I, I recorded as at a studio called Grouse Lodge, which is in the is out in um, County Westmeath, which is you know another fantastic location and a great studio. Yeah, Rockfield, you know Rockfield, which is alleged to be like one of the first or the first residential studio in the world hmm. down there in Wales. That was great. Um, yeah, there's many many really cool spots. And Memphis, Memphis has always been really fun for me too. Like when I go down there and work with the Lucero, we worked at Ardent. Oh, cool. I've I done love, three love records down there. Yeah, I do too. We did three, I've done three records down there at, at Ardent with them. And, and the history of that place is just fantastic. And I, you know, I can never get over that. I feel like, you know, it just you sort of finish a session and I'll walk around, you know, walk around the city and, and I just feel like I'm walking amongst the ghosts, you know, yeah. I feel like everything that I grew up with listening to, you know, the songs that I listened to on the radio sort of for a lifetime, I feel like there's so much of it originated from those streets and those studios in Memphis. Are there some particular artists or records that you remember rediscovering um, that are top of mind from your last time you were in Memphis? In Memphis? Um, well, I, I sort of dug in a little bit to, I guess, the history of um, some of the guys that, all, you know, that I was working with. I mean, I liked a lot of the old, Digging into a lot of the old Memphis Jug stuff, and then Memphis of course, Jug. Yeah, well, oh, I don't know about that. Memphis Jug bands, you know, of the nineteen twenties. Wow, and 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 that sort of ties together and ties in again with with old with the old crow stuff, you know, where you know you had a lot of street musicians that didn't have any instruments, so they they would makeshift instruments and they would blow on jugs and you know just sort of they would. Have, you know, they would make do with what they had to make the music. Yeah, but, there was, um, you know, there was the band that um, Carolina Chocolate Drops came through my Bonnaroo studio one year and yeah. he was sort of beatboxing with a jug, which was pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. I think we actually sort of thought about having him come in and do it because those guys are all really good friends. And then we ended up, there was one of the guys from, I think Gil from Old Crow was pretty good at it. So we let him do it. Nice. Uh, how do you mic up a jug? Oh man, I don't know. you just <laughs> <laughs> you put a you put the mic somewhere in the vicinity and move it around till it sounds okay. You know? All right, cool. <laughs> <laughs> Do, it, it doesn't require five mics to properly mic a jug or something like that. No, I don't remember using five. No, uh, I mean we actually that studio we we worked at Blackbird. We did the last record I did with Old Crow, we did at Blackbird. So we were sort of spoiled for mics too because he's got. I think he's got probably the biggest mic collection in the, or one of the biggest mic yep. collections in the world down there. So I think at one point we looked out into the room and we had a U47 on about everything. <laughs> well, we can, so we will. <laughs> Let me ask you that tough question. So when you're in an environment where you have sort of unlimited choice, how did you handle that and how did you not let that derail your session? <laughs> we take full advantage of it. I don't know. I mean, I think you just always have to try and keep everything in perspective. You know, and I think that's just become a fairly natural process. And, you know, there's a there's a sort of an order of, of importance to things for me. So, you know, while it's lovely to be able to have a U47 on everything, it's not really, that's not really the, the most important element. So you sort of work within those boundaries of like, you know, it's fun, but keep it in perspective, you know. Well, do you ever find that experience where it's like when you're faced with you know, choice of five things and they all sound great, you know, it, at the first one that sounds great, you're just done. Just don't, don't yeah. look for another option. Yeah. No, I, I tend to work a bit like that. I think for me, I think that was an early, early lesson. I think sort of working while I was still in bands and, and observing the sort of damage that, um, the inability for someone to make a decision, like quick decisions, yeah. they, they can be sort of, they can wreck things. And I think, there's a challenge with that always because you do know the answer. You, you always know the answer. It's just sort of being in tune with yourself enough to know, to be able to read yourself. You know, so if you're presented with five things, you can sit there for an hour and sort of pontificate and go backwards and forwards, or you could just sort of really tune yourself in and go, that's that one. Yeah. You know, make the decision. 
make the decision. That's good advice right there. Um, well, well, even even to you know, and I think sort of even if it's the wrong decision, it's still the right one because it's the one that you made. Right, because you, you're on you to know, the next it, thing because, now. Yeah, exactly. So it's like e- even if it wasn't the best sounding one, I'm a I'm sort of a believer in that. That you know, it, it's a it's a constantly unfolding process, and and you you know it's quite difficult to make the wrong decision because you're sort of, as long as you're making the honest decision at the time, I think you're always going to be okay. Uh, That's good. I like it. Well, so I like to ask guests to share an inspirational quote at the beginning of the podcast. Have you got anything that else that's as inspiring as that you want to share? (laughs) Do I have anything inspiring to say? Um, Be honest. Be honest. All right, cool, cool. (laughs) I like that. Uh, Be as honest as you can. That sounds really sort of lofty, doesn't it? Well, know. hey, we did good. We started out by admitting that we're we're doing this over Skype on an <laughs> iPhone, and we might run out of batteries. So I'll, I'll keep us moving right along. Um, also, I like to share uh, a story about an important failure in the studio. Have you got anything that um, you know kind of was a real failure for you, but turned into a great learning experience? Fail, fail, um. <laughs> never. <laughs> A big failure or a great failure. I don't know which failure to bring up. Um, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if I'd call it a failure necessarily, but but maybe, maybe it's sort of going back to that. You know, maybe it's going back to the idea. I think there was one record when I was in a band where I, I watched a producer and a bass player sort of spend hours and hours sort of listening over you know, a very short passage of music for trying to figure out whether the bass was actually in tune. Oh, man. And and I, and I realized the damage of, again, I think it's that damage to not make a decision or sort of overthinking things can sort of just slow everything down. And I watched the whole room sort of slow and the whole session as it, you know, as it happens, sort of yeah. slow into a grinding halt. And I think that was something that I carry, you know, carry pretty closely. And that I try and Never, and, and I've been lucky so far that you know we've never had that happen. We always managed to yeah, keep things moving and to spot the situation that could possibly do that and, and deal with it accordingly and keep everything moving. Nice. Well, so um, let's carry that forward. Let's talk about a couple of things like dropkick Murphy's flogging Molly. I want to ask you how you approach a recording session with bands like those? And also how long, you know, if things are moving, what does a typical recording session feel like you as far as time frame? You know, do you think about going into the studio for a day and accomplishing, you know, X number of this or that? Um, again, I think that sort of, you know, that varies according to a bunch of different things. I think, you know, some situations, some bands just move faster than others. Some it's it's a necessity, you know, we just don't have a lot of time. So we have to figure out, right, well, we'll we'll use that as an artistic expression too. You know, the fact that we only have five days to work on these songs will have an effect on the way that they sound, but we'll we'll turn that around to make that a positive effect. They'll have a raw quality about them. We won't be able to overthink things. It will force us to move through things quickly and make very quick decisions and be impulsive. And that will have a, you know, that will have an end result. And I think especially for younger bands, actually, you know, and, and in many cases, it, it, it's, a, it's a good thing for older, you know, or more established bands too. But um, I think, you know, yeah, it, it changes. There's not really a standard, you know, with, with a Dropkicks record, it might take a while because we'll get together and go through songs and, and we'll do it piecemeal to some degree because those guys tour so much. Um, mm. you know, we'll, 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 we'll set a, a period of time aside and we'll go get together for a week, 10 days, and we'll just pull up all the ideas and we'll go through song ideas and we'll just flush those out. And then I'll leave for a while, go work on another record. They'll go on tour. And while they're on tour, they'll sort of dig deeper and sort of work on some of the, you know, some of the things that we started and then we'll get back together again and we'll maybe do another one of those sessions, go through songs again. And then we'll go to the studio. But I think, you know, the one thing I like to do, which is not always possible, is, is to do a lot of pre-production. Yeah. You know, I think because that, you know, and inside that there's the songwriting, you know, it's sort of, you know, if you're working with a new band, I think it's that period of time where you sort of, you know, you get to know each other and you gain trust and you sort of, and you, you sort of start to get to know each other over the material and you start to try to push 
the songwriting and you sh- and the playing and just the focus and the direction of the band. And those are all things that I think take a little bit of time because you you, you know you, you have to earn the trust of this. You have to have a somewhat of a relationship with somebody before you can start to really do that well. I think. Yeah, well, I think pre-production is fantastic, and I love when I've been able to have that experience. But I don't always get that experience. Um, yeah, and I imagine there's a difference between pre-production with your own band and pre-production as sort of a hired producer for a session. What advice do you have? as a producer working with another band as far as pre-production, you know, without necessarily being too specific, how do you account for the budgeting and the time to make sure that happens appropriately as part of the record-making process? Well, it, I mean, if you have the budget, then, you know, that's not an issue. But it, the, the problems come when, you've, when you're caught with, you know, maybe a lack of budget or maybe a, a lack of time because of a schedule. You know, and I'll always bend with that. I mean, if there's a way to sort of, I'll go the extra mile as far as sort of making time for for the pre-production stuff because I believe it is important. Then the other thing I'll try and do too, um, if it's not, you know, I I just returned from Ireland on a project which was pretty much fly in and fly out. And I think I spent, you know, uh, literally six days of studio time to record five songs. And then I brought them back to California to mix. But what I tried to do with that and maybe, you know, an idea for people, if you don't have the ability to get in the same room with people, is to do Skype stuff or, you know, or FaceTime stuff where you, you know, you you actually get in contact with people, even though you're on the other side of the world. And you share your musical, you know, you share the things that you're enthusiastic about musically. You, you, you talk about the records you like. You talk about the you know, all the things that we're talking about. You get to know each other. And then you can also sort of, you know, email songs, song ideas back and forward too. And you can sort of get a little bit of that work done pre getting into the room together that way. So I guess that's sort of like a pre-production, pre-production situation. Yeah. I actually did my first Skype pre-production last year where I was doing a record and it was, it was my niece actually. And she was, yeah. um, or my cousin's daughter and, and uh, she came down. And so we did a Skype session. She was able to show me songs and, and it was pretty remarkable how much we accomplished that way. You can't play together at the same time. You can't harmonize together or play along with each other, but you can listen to somebody and then give your idea and listen back, you know? Yeah, it's, it's definitely a very useful tool. It's, it's not for me anyway, it's not as, it's not the same as being in the room. I mean, yeah. and I think, I think that's another thing that you learn to do as a producer is you learn to read a room. You know, you, you as you suggest ideas and as you sort of put ideas back and forth, you you have your eye on the room and your and the players and you and you can gauge how far or how you know how, how much or how little you can push each yeah. idea at the time, which is quite difficult to do over Skype because you can't see everybody. And then, of course, you get that idea. You're, you're sort of trying to write, and you get this idea coming up for a bridge, and then you look at the Skype, and it's frozen, and you've been jamming away for the last, <laughs> like, <laughs> last minute with this great idea. And yeah, and nobody's idea. listening. <laughs> Hopefully, the record won't be like that. <laughs> um, okay, so now let's talk about pre-production with a band versus pre-production with an artist who's, you know, the songwriter, an individual. Yeah. I don't know how often you're assembling a band around a songwriter. What's that difference like? I mean, you know, I think if you have a band that plays together, you can get into a room and, and you can sort of work out the tunes. But if you're hiring musicians, do you find that it's that you still recommend bringing in the hired musicians just for pre-production with the artist, or do you work with the artist and then just hit the studio with the hired musicians? Mm, that's an interesting one, actually. Um, I mean, there's, there's definitely a difference and, and there's a, and they're definitely different kinds of records. And I think the records that I've been involved in that weren't band records, I've pretty much got together with the artists. I play guitar. So and I can kind of play most things that have strings on them, sort of. So I can cover all that. And I think what we do, you know, if I'm thinking back, we sort of get a very, very good idea of, of what it is that we want to accomplish. And then I'll have, you know, players, drummers, or whoever, you know, whoever that we need in mind that will fit that. And then we may get together for a couple of days once we've kind of, once we've outlined all the songs and the arrangements and we'll do all that just between the artist and myself. 
who will take that into a room with the drummer. Or, and, and usually, you know, somebody that's going to come in at that point is, is going to be of a caliber that they'll pick it up pretty quickly. And you're also picking up and you're using people that sort of fit too, hopefully. So, yeah. you know, that's it's all going to unfold fairly naturally. You're bringing people in because you like what they do. So mm-hmm. you're really, you know... I think if you know it would be problematic if you weren't in a situ- weren't in a position to be able to sort of know who to call on for that kind of thing yeah and i you know I noticed there are some things you can work out with the songwriter, but you know like an outro that just kind of jams with the band, you really can't work that out with the songwriter. you just kind of have to wait till let the band's playing and just let it happen and it is what it is you know? yeah well i think there's always you know all the way through a record at every single i think at every point there's always that evolution of creativity and i think you know my goal really before hitting the studio is to sort of make sure i've got i've got all the outlines you know it's a it's a safety right, point really right. and, and i've got all the songs arranged to a point where i'm happy with those and i'm not looking for stuff you know, I'm not going into the studio going, man, this song really doesn't have a chorus or this this has no lyrics or this bridge. The words that, you know, I, I'm, I've got all those things as, as, as well as I can. They're all figured out. So I think hopefully then what happens is you've set a really good bed for those things to happen. So the next thing that will happen will be all the elaborations and the things that sort of take it all to another level and the unexpected moments. And and, you know, watching great players sort of do things that you didn't expect them to do and going, wow, that's fantastic. I didn't plan for that, but we're keeping it, you know. Yeah. That, and those are the things that keep it exciting, too. You know, I think if you over control the situation, it just, you know, you're taking the heart and soul out of it. So I think to some degree what you're really doing is, you're, you know, you're trying to make sure that you've got yourself covered as far as anything sort of falling through the bottom. but. Yeah. But you're also you're also not definitely not putting a cap on where it could all possibly go. And that even goes as far as to sort of say, well, I want you to keep writing songs while we're working on the album. Yes, we've picked out the 12 songs, 13, 14 songs for the record. But if you come up with something fantastic, let's sit down with this and see how we bring this into the record, because the whole thing is a creative process from beginning to end. And I don't want to leave any opportunities for something great to happen out. Yeah. That's good advice. Um, and, you know, another thing I find sometimes with pre-production is it's just a matter of sort of doing your homework as the producer, too. Getting yeah, getting to know yeah. everything, you know, when you talk about outlining. Yeah, I think so. And you immerse yourself in it, too. You know, you, you know, you I mean, it, it's a great experience, too, to sort of decompress from the previous project sort of dig back into your record collection and your world of music and films and books that inspire you and sort of recalibrate yourself for the next step, you know, because you're always drawing from that natural place, the thing that you sort of keep yourself honest and true with. I mean, everything has a slightly different flavor and a direction on it. And, and, you know, for me, I've always thought it's a, it's a really fun way for me to sort of compartmentalize my record collection and go, this record's going to be this part of the record right. collection, <laughs> you know, and, and then you rediscover things that you haven't been listening to for a while or, and you are able to go a bit deeper into that world this time. And, you know, it keeps it changing. I think that's important that it, that you keep stuff changing up. Yeah. I think that was why it was always hard for me to stay in a band. It's too much of the same thing all the time. Yeah. <laughs> I, honestly, I felt like, you know, it, it's a, it's you get torn because I do love that. But but I would feel like, you know, while I was in Flogging Molly, I'd feel like I love being in Flogging Molly and I love being the guitar player in Flogging Molly. But but it's I, I can't just do that. You know, my I want to be broader than that. Yeah. There's there's places to explore and places to go. Yeah. So uh, let me jump forward with more questions. Um, you're working with Dropkick Murphys and Flogging Molly in the studio. To click track or not to click track? Oh, for me, it's... <laughs> I, oh, I sorry, I wanted that. to make that sound like an epic question. <laughs> um, yeah, I always go with a click track. Fascinating. Mm-hmm. Okay, I, I wasn't going yeah. to expect that that was the answer. Yeah. I mean, I'll be sort of unconventional with it sometimes, but I mean, I have, it's a personal thing for me too. I I really struggle with rhythms that, you know, rhythm sections that are sort of floundering about. Yeah, It's got to be, you know, it's got to be tight and swinging to me. 
Interesting. So we try so, we, everything and, we can do to make that happen. And when we're thinking dropkick Murphys and flogging Molly, are we thinking about a drum set or are we thinking about not a drum set? I, nice I, drum, drum set. We yeah. do. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah. But some, and we'll sometimes, and we'll sometimes let it be, you know, we'll let it float a little bit. And, and then, you know, sometimes also there's, there's, you know, there are songs where, uh, you know, it just doesn't feel right to have it a constant tempo. You know, so I think there was one track I think we did where we dropped the, we played around with the tempos all over the place. I think it was a track called Boys Are Back. Right. Where we, we pulled the tempo back four beats per minute on the pre-choruses so that we could sort of recoil for the chorus. Ah, um, interesting. So when you listen to it, it sort of drops right down before the chorus and then the chorus and then even I think the chorus is slower than the verse. And, you know, so there was a whole mapping going on with that one. And I think, you know, I'm fortunate, too, with bands like that, that they'll allow me to play around with things and they'll give me the time to, you know, and they'll trust me with sort of play at this tempo, play that bit of this tempo. Let me cut those together, see how that, you know, and they'll let me do it. And fortunately, it worked out okay. So, <laughs> <laughs> what are some ways that you accomplish that that tempo change with a click track? Do, is it something where you draw out a click track that's changing time, and the band's playing to it, or are you are you typically maybe doing sections at certain tempos and then putting it back together? Any advice there? Well, well with that one, I did sections. I think I, I tracked the song at one tempo, the whole thing at, at what I thought was the main tempo the best tempo. And then as I listened to it, I felt like, you know, maybe the chorus would, be, the chorus just felt a little on the front for me. So I said, can we, you know, play me a pre-chorus through the chorus into the post-chorus, just play it for me a couple of times. And I, I tried a different, a couple of different tempos with that. And then I also felt the same with the pre-chorus. So I, I got the guys to play me the verse into the pre-chorus, into the chorus a few times at different tempos. And then I sent them all out to go get dinner, and I just sat there and got all the bits <laughs> together until it, until it felt like it sort of went through its motions, you know, in the way that it, it you know, that felt right to me. Um, talk about that a little bit, because I think you just casually mentioned a really important tactic in the studio as a producer or an engineer. You sent them all out to dinner while you worked on the edits. So talk about that process of wanting to do something that is going to take some effort, like comping a vocal, like comping takes together, and whether or not the artist and the band should be involved in that process, or what's yeah. the best way to present it? Um, my experience with that has always been you can you have, I'm, I'm totally happy for anyone that wants to be here during this process to be here. I've always felt like, you know, the idea of sort of shrouding something and saying, I need, I mean, I was kind of semi-joking when, when I said sending them out to dinner because they didn't need prompting. But, yeah. um, you know, it, it's... Um, they like dinner. I, I, yeah, they like, <laughs> yeah, we all do. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's that trust element. You know, when you have a good relationship and you have a good team going, you know, I, I think it's very important that before you set out to work on a record that you establish that, that you say, look, you've got to allow everybody to have their shot at doing what they do best. Don't get in people's way over things. If you don't like the end result, you don't like the end result and we'll figure that out. And, and I always sort of make a big case too of like, I'll never force an artist to do something that they really, really don't want to do. It's a collaboration. Totally. It's always the artist's record. I mean, you know, I think it's always very important to respect that, that a lot of these bands have been out there for a long time doing this. They put their, you know, they put their lives into this mm -hmm. and it's to be respected. And I do have a very good, a very firm sight on that at all times. So, you know, I think, you know, if you're working with people that you share an excitement and a passion for, for you know, for you have a lot of similarities in the things that you like. I think you, you, you're, you're going to be okay in most cases with that. Every now and then something won't work out. And, and in those cases, I think it's also important to be able to, you know, to be able to sort of accept that too and go, well, that one didn't work. Okay, on to the next one. And not, not allow that to be sort of a big deal. If you don't take risks and you don't try stuff out, then you don't really ever accomplish anything great, I don't think. Yeah. Well, so and as far as the stuff like the, um, you know, sorry to butt, but I mean, the stuff like the vocal comping, I, I find more and more people just don't want to be, you know, there are artists that will sit there and sort of scrutinize everything you're doing. 
but the more fun and I think that the, the more successful records that I've been involved in, with, they, they don't do that. They, there's a degree of trust. Right. And there's always, you know, there's that moment where, well, let's come in and go through this. Is there anything that's sort of sticking out there and it's bothering you? And, well, let's look at that. Let's fix it. It has to be a nice, even sort of back and forth with things and, and not putting people in positions where you're trying to force them to do something against their will. Yeah. You and know, I, you, I would say that uh, as people have experience with comping vocals, they realize it sucks. And <laughs> so they learn to not want to be in the studio <laughs> well, for it. Well, too. that's the thing about, you know, I, I learned that early on with mixing and stuff like that. You know, you get young bands, they're like, I, I need to be there during the mix. And, and, I've, and I've had conversations with managers, record labels, where I'm like, it's fine, let them be there. Because I know that after one day, they won't be there anymore. Right, they won't. Want you know, they'll sit around, <laughs> they'll be like, this is really boring. And I'll say, let me do let me do this. And then when I've got it to a point where I think it's rocking, come in and, and then we'll go through a few things, you know. And right. that seems to be a bit of a pattern. And fortunately, it's a, you know, it's a fairly painless process in most cases. Uh, I just had a vision. A, a mix is a bit like a, a baby being born. And it doesn't talk yet. <laughs> yeah. But when it's, when it's old enough to talk, then come in and we can have a then conversation. Right? <laughs> well, I think that, you know, these are important things too. I mean, I think it, I, I've been, I, I try very hard to not, you know, to, to try to sort of make sure that people understand that I, I, you don't, you, you, you don't want to criticize something until it's at a point where it's ready to be criticized. Otherwise we're just sort of, all falling over something here. You know, right. you've got to allow somebody. And that, that works both ways too. That works for me as a producer when, when an artist has an idea. You know, it, I have to be careful also to step out of the way sometimes and go, let me let your idea, let me let your idea, you know, evolve before I jump in and sort of try to steer it anywhere. Yeah. And that's a difficult one. And I think that if you, if you view these things from both sides, I think it sort of helps to keep you on track with it. If you, if you sort of understand that this works both ways, they give you the respect to sort of do the thing you do, but you have to also make sure that you give them the respect to sort of unfold and evolve things in the way that they do as artists. I think that's great advice. Well, l let me keep moving forward and we'll get into some how-to questions. So you brought up The Boys Are Back, Dropkick Murphys, signed and, signed and Sealed in Blood is the album. It has this massive gang vocal on it. In fact, the whole sound of the song is just one big massive. <laughs> so <laughs> talk about recording effective gang vocals. Teach us what we didn't know we didn't know well, about didn't getting know. killer gang vocals on records. It layers of vocals. It, it, there's three layers of vocals. There's, I don't, we're giving away all the secrets, but um, give them all away. The this is the right yeah. place. <laughs> you, what we do in those with those is, I think, what we did was we did a, a layer of close vocals, which would be basically the band would be Tim, James, Jeff, and whoever's doing those close vocals, um, and then we would do a set of maybe whoever's around sort of extra vocals where we'd step it all back off the mics and into the room a little bit more. And we would record everybody on, we'd set up the stereo mics. We'd have everybody sort of record on one side and then we would move everybody onto the other side to double that. And Interesting. We may do so that the, so the stereo times. mic stays in one spot, yeah, but the people yeah. move. Yeah. That's what we do. Yeah. We, we would move. The, the people from one side of the room to the other. And then to finish it off where it felt like it needed to be huge. And I would base this, you know, I, I would base this on sort of like trying to weld that idea of the band and the audience together. It's like, for me, I felt like it, it's trying to create the, ele the element of this is the bit where everybody sings along. So literally put the audience in there singing along actually with the band on the recording. So I think, with that, with Boys Are Back and with the big gang vocals, then Ken literally went out and sort of dragged a bunch of people into the studio, sort of made an event of it. I think we had about 35, 40 people in the studio and we drew up the lyric sheets and held them up. And, and it was really fun. You know, it's kind of an event. Do you think it's that sort of was, like, the, was the stereo mic still in that one spot yeah, or did you have everybody yeah, on the yeah, wrong no. side of the stereo mic now? Well, <laughs> the back it, side. It, well it, in this case, what we would do is we'd fill the back half of the studio with people and then they would sing, you know, the parts that we needed. And then I'd get everybody to just shuffle, you know, so everybody that was on the left now I'll move over onto the, everybody change places. And we would make sure also that we had a few girls in there too, to sort of 
you uh, know, to get the, the everything's dynamic better with there. girls. Of course, it always is. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> um, what about uh, uh, headphones? Do, when you're doing a gang vocal, does everybody need headphones, or do you have like well, one or two pairs, and and they're sort nah, of conducting everybody I mean, else? I think what we did for that was that we we just put up the we put the playback out into the room, and I, I just tried to had I tried to balance it so that I wasn't getting you know. Obviously, I, I didn't want people to feel inhibited, but I felt like once they got going with the vocal, as long as we had enough of the track for them to sort of adhere somewhat to rhythm-wise, um, it was enough. There was no way I could get, you know, 35, 40 pairs of headphones all set up. So right. we, do, we did it like that. We literally played the music out through the, you know, through the monitors into the, into the live room. And are you most and, and, likely playing music that's going to end up in the final mix anyway? So yeah, you're not, yeah, you're not yeah. sneaking stuff in that you wish was deleted. No, I'll keep the basic track there. So it'll be, you know, it would be the drums, bass, two guitars, or whatever, or, you know, maybe the main vocal or whatever we really felt like we needed to be able to get what we needed done. And there's been a couple of situations where I've done that, you know, I've done a similar thing with, you know, with that in the control room, to be honest, too, where, Sometimes headphones are just sort of inhibitive and, and I've had singers that I don't know why, but I'm just not feeling this performance. And, and, you know, we've done stuff where we've had them sort of come into the control room, crank it up and have them sort of hold a SM7 or something in the control room, put the speakers out of phase. So we're getting as, you know, as little of the actual bleed as we can into the mic, but just let them do a performance in front of the track. Interesting. Yeah, I've heard about the speakers out of phase trick. Do you feel like you can explain that to the rock stars, what that is and, and why that might or might well, not work? I guess basically what you're trying to do is you're trying to see, you're sending the signal out into the into the you know wide left and right. So you're hopefully not picking up as much as you would and you're not picking up as much as the track as you would if you had everything in phase and, and all, all going. In other words, um, the, the speakers way. are sort of by the time they hit where the mic is and the singer is, they're hopefully the low end sort of canceling itself, yeah. itself out. It's all yeah. canceled, yeah. yeah it's and cool. it's surprising too, you know. I, again, you know, if you're singing into a track that you're going to be using anyway, I mean, I'll always, always go for the performance over the sound quality. So, you know, I feel like if you don't have somebody sort of pouring their heart into it, it doesn't matter how good a quality the sound is. It just has nothing in it. So, yeah. Um, now, what about the ways that you're recording this stuff. When you are doing these gang vocals, are you on analog tape or are you recording to digital in something like Pro Tools? It's Pro Tools, yeah. Yeah, and I think, you know, the the good thing about Pro Tools too is that, you know, for me, when you're doing these things and you're in a process of sort of, you're gathering your data, you know, you're gathering your information. So you get the opportunity because it's Pro Tools to be able to go do this, try it this way, stand over there. And I'm just getting a whole bunch of stuff which I'll then take away later and go through and I'll use the pieces that I want to use. And I think that would be a very difficult thing to do if we were working on tape. Yeah, it's almost more like um, location recording for film. You just need to get yeah. lots and lots and lots then go back it. and, and yeah, put it together. Yeah, I think that's exactly it. And I think, you know, to some degree that happens with certain projects like throughout the recording of the record too. You're sort of throwing ideas up. And I feel like, you know, when you're in the heat of it and, you you know, in order to keep things moving, you don't want to pontificate and you don't want to sit there and sort of make, if I'm in a position where I, I feel like, you know, it's going to take me a while to make a decision on this and, and doing that is going to slow the process of recording and, and, and the mood down. I'm very grateful for the ability to be able to, be able to play less stuff and then just put a note in the comments box and I'll, I'll come back to that at a point where I can, you know, so yeah. you, you're sort of making work for yourself further along the road, but, but you're also sort of, you know, it's also coming from the place of, you know, you have time in the studio with these people and you want to gather as much cool stuff as you can in order to sort of construct your record with it. Yeah. I'm always finding it remarkable how we w- might record a ton of stuff in the studio, but when I come back to it later, I, I discover I don't really need all that stuff. Like yeah. I kind of only need the last couple or something, you know? Yeah. Well, I think there's an art in that too. And I think you have to be able to be disciplined with that in order to do it. You know, I I think, you know, I, I was, I worked with a, you know, we went, we went back to sort of talking about the, the learning process with other producers. And I, I think I worked with someone who, 
who sort of had the feeling that all of it was valid. And, you know, and, and at the time, because I was in the band, I just felt this just sounds like overblown. It, it sort of feels like there's too many, you know, there's too many ingredients in my stew or whatever. Here. It's like, I only have room for one or two really cool ideas at a time. And I don't know if I'm, you know, I don't know if that's just me or that's just the way that, you know, we listen to music, but the idea of having too many things almost sort of cancels, they cancel each other out and you sort of end up with nothing. So you do have to make those calls. You do have yeah. to pick the things that are moving you. And sometimes it's hard because you'll have two or three things that are all good. Well, especially if you're it, doing, you know, this music that has a, um, you know, a, a nod to Irish it, yeah. traditional music like Flogging Molly, uh, Dropkick Murphys. There are so many cool instruments you could pick up and add another line to the yeah. to the recording, you know. Let's double that. But, Let's triple that. But, the, but part of that, the art of that is it's, it's frequencies too, because you, you know, I think with that, you keep it simple by, you know, you have your, your, your refrains and the lines and the things that you, you want to use and I feel like I'm pretty attuned now to be to be able to say that line there is clutter in that one and it's making it null and void so let's pull that one out if we want to like if we want to add stuff we can add stuff in the frequency range so if you want to put something on there put a mandolin on there that's up high put a bazooki on there that's down lower put some put a piano line down there so so you're filling the frequency out so you're yeah. making it high to, you're making it high to low rather than just adding a whole bunch of confusing sounds. And that's not to say that, I mean, done, done really, really well. There are things there where people can use, and there, there are some people that are sort of genius with counter melodies and things. And I love that too, you know, where you can actually, you can have two or three melodies working, but they all work really well together and they all, and they highlight and emphasize each other. But, um, you know, I think it's, it's being able to spot, the difference between something that's really moving and, and sort of clear and something that's just confusing. Yeah. And, and I imagine that there must be some experiences sometimes where as a producer, you're confused by it, but in trusting the artist, you discover later on that they had a great idea. Yeah. I mean, horns are a good, horns are a great example. Well, I'm glad you brought that up. I wanted to ask you about the mighty, mighty boss tones. The horns. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that that's a really fun one because, because that literally does do that for me. That's something where, you know, they'll bring, they'll go away, figure parts out and, and you won't really know what you got until you got all the parts. So, so part, here's part one and it goes, then here's part two. And you're like, Oh, Oh, I don't know about this. But then when part three goes on, you go, ha, ah, that's fantastic. It, it all kind of, about, it, it all speak, they all speak to each other. Right. Cause you're building so, it one part at a time in the yeah, studio. Yeah. Well, I guess it's, you know, it's in some ways, it's like the, you know, the bass, the guitar and, and the keyboard. It's like, you know, when you hear the three things together, that they're, they're all sort of filling different. Again, it goes back to that frequency thing. And that's a, that's part of the horns as well. You know, you've got the trombones down and then you've got the sort of higher instruments. So you're filling out the spectrum from top to bottom. But in that, there are nice counter melodies that happen too. You know, when you have somebody who's really cool at putting horn parts together. Have you found yourself in a position as a producer of trying to compose the horn arrangement yourself and guide it along? Mm. Or do you typically try and approach it where you have a, a horn player who's a leader for the section who's responsible for doing that the right way? I think I've been very fortunate with all the horn stuff that I've been involved in where, I mean, that is, that is one element where I'd be honest and I'd be like, I, I can suggest the melody or I can go, you know, how about something like this? Or I can say, here's a record that I love and I love the way the horns are on there. Can you take that away and figure out how you would come up with something that's of that flavor? But, you know, that's a world where I feel like it's a good idea to let somebody who really knows what they're doing do it. Yeah. I, I know that I've been in situations where I have utterly beat up a horn player all day only to prove to myself that I really am not the one who should <laughs> be the horn. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's interesting. It, you know, it really does sort of stand, stand aside. It's like, I think when you, for me anyway, it's just, there are many things that I will get involved in and sort of get into the mechanics of it, but but the horn stuff brings somebody in that really knows what they're doing with it. Yeah, that's where I learned words like embouchure, which translation, the horn player can't keep playing as long as you'd like to keep recording. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> it's physically well, suppose, not possible, you know, you know. Yeah, e- even things like that, you know, you, you there are the things that you don't think about like that, you know. It would be nice to have this pad go right through the chorus. Yeah, well, I, I can't do that. I actually don't. It, my it lungs just aren't can't that breathe that long. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I've had a few instances where I've gone, you know, wouldn't it be cool if the horns did this? And I've looked out and I've got like a look back that's like, no. no that's the worst <laughs> idea ever. <laughs> Um, so, well, let's yeah. talk more about recording the Mighty Mighty Boss Tones horns. Um, what do you want to say about microphone choices and, and in, you know, the different horns? What do we need to know if we don't know anything about this yet? Well, we try to keep it very ribbony. I mean, we'll, we'll use like the Royers or the Coles or, you know, or that's that such like to sort of, you know, I like that sort of older, you know, more saturated, grainy sort of sound. Yeah. Um, we uh, we try and keep stuff fairly separated so I can kind of manipulate it a little bit if I need to later. So, you know, we will record rooms, but we'll, we'll, we'll sort of baffle and separate. So, you know, we'll try and set it up so every, so there's a, there's a, you know, eye contact and a feeling that everybody's in the room together, but I can try and separate as much as I can. You can rebalance um, the horns, in other words. The, the yeah, yeah. Mics. I want to have, con- yeah. I want to be able to have control over it. I mean, there are there are some things that I've done where we've just gone. You know what? Let's just get the live vibe on this, and what we get is what we get. But I think it, you know, from experience with this, it's it's always nice to be able to have the ability to be able to sort of you know, manipulate a bit if need be, you know, because the other thing that you're doing also when you're recording, you may make a decision about a length or something. You may make a decision about a part. You you know, you you want to be able to have some degree of malleability with the sounds and performances that you've got. So that's, that's important to me. Um, sound wise. I mean, we usually just, you, you know, for delays and things I like use, I, I just recently really like the, you know, we've been playing around with tape slapbacks mm-hmm. or, you know, the, the sort of short plate with the, you know, with the slapback sort yeah. of process in there, yeah. you know, so we're pushing the sound away from the actual sort of percussion of the downbeat, but allowing the, you know, the slapback and tape to sort of hang on a little afterwards. Um, so yeah. rock, rock stars to translate, I, I think what you're saying is you would, you would have a short plate reverb. So it's very short. It doesn't sound like a long whoosh reverb no not not washes no but, 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 but would, again that's with the boss tones because yeah that's with the bosses because because they're fairly punchy so everything's moving pretty quickly so you want to create a little depth in there but you don't want it to get unclear and washy yeah and i tend to like you know i like all that sort of old studio one stuff and you know the the, the way that stuff has that sort of slightly distorted tape tape slap or tape delay on it um I've always liked the plate reverb, the sound of the plate reverb over anything digital. So if I'm in a situation where I can do that, which I try to try to be in, we'll, we'll do that. Um, um, what are some things that you've found useful? Um, you know, we're all sort of in DAW world, Pro Tools, Logic, PreSonus. Those are probably the the big three for the rock stars. Yeah. Um, and not to exclude anybody who's not using those three, they're all great. But what are some tricks for emulating some of that kind of stuff in plugin world and within a DAW? Oh, to get to get stuff to sound that way? Yeah. Mm. I mean, any anything that sort of distorts well, I guess. You know, I think we use, there's a, a tape simulator, I think, that we use sometimes. Mm-hmm. Oh, and then there's the, uh, is it the sound toys, the decapitator? Right, yep, that's um, a good one. That's pretty cool. But I mean, I think, you know, for me, again, it's about being subtle with it. So you're not just blowing everything in and obliterating it. You're just right. sort of adding a bit of graininess to stuff, you know, so that it's, you know, it's got that sort of natural sound to it. And and then the other idea that, you know, that, or the other thing that we try to do is try to go in to Pro Tools using stuff that that's not necessarily a plug-in, you know, literally get hold of a, a, a rolling space echo or a you know a you know an old an echo old tape delay or an echo, echo plex or even run that you know the, the the quarter inch or use something that gets it through tape and tape heads nice so you're getting that yeah or a spring spring's really good too we've been yeah. using that bit recently i'm, I'm actually standing right next to me as a master room spring reverb that just sounds great cool yeah, and they all have their own sound, I think, too. And it's, you know, I think there's nothing quite like the, the, the real thing. 
So I wanted to ask you this too, and then we'll take a break here and come back in for the jam session. But you talked about doing like um, five songs in six days. And I, mm -hmm. I, I'm used to, or I see that sort of thing often, you know, especially in independent world, people come there like, we just want to knock it out in four days, five days, whatever. We got this big thing to do. How do you navigate that? How do you, or what are some tricks you have or ways to stay organized or advice for listeners as far as figuring out how to fit stuff into that time frame and get to the end and, and be, if not perfectly, you know, having nailed it in that time frame, close enough to feel real good about it? Mm, that's an interesting one. Um, be prepared to be up very late. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm out. I think, I think you have to, um, I think it's important to keep a perspective and prioritize and make sure you keep the, you know, keep the, keep the eye on the thing that's the things that are important. So yeah. you, you're going, you know, you, you can't afford, I think when you're doing stuff that quickly, everything has to be very spontaneous. And I think that you have to sort of be confident and comfortable in the, the charm the thing will, the charm of the thing will be in the fact that you did it quickly. That, you know, some of the records that I love, you know, are, are sort of low budget records, but they have an amazing spirit. And, and I think, especially for young bands, it, it's about capturing, you've got to capture something there. Right. You know, and, and you're not likely to make something that's super slick and super tight, tight at that, you know, at, yeah. at that speed. So don't, don't try. And and don't get caught up. If you get caught up on something, then then you won't make it. Move on. And I think there's that you know sort so there's also an interesting. I think there's a lesson in that too. It's like I, I think I learned early on too that if you have something that's giving you trouble that just won't go the way that you want it to do, change direction very quickly. Yeah. Rather than spending time, you know, if this is not working after a few takes, it's because something's speaking to you saying it's not meant to go that way. Change direction. And that's a creative decision too. And, and often those things will lead you down another path that event that you'll, you know, in a couple of days time, you'll go, that's really cool. I love the way that ended up there. And it wouldn't have happened if we hadn't hit a roadblock trying to do the thing that we thought we all wanted to do at that earlier point. So do you find that it's easier to, you know, look at two days and say, yeah, I think we can track three songs each day and knock out six songs or whatever it is in two days. And it's harder to say, but for the next three days, we're going to somehow knock out all the overdubs that are needed for those. I guess that's like getting into the slick production thing. The more overdubs you do, the more piece by piece you're making the process. Do you have any advice for properly planning how you're going to navigate mm -hmm. overdubs yeah. in, in time? Well, I think what I did with this one that I just did was it was a band and I think that when you're working through things quickly, that sort of, you know, that that's kind of a, an, an ad, it's an advantage to sort of, I think, well, go through everything in its raw form. So what we did was we set all the instruments up and then we sat in the control room of the studio. And then I got basically the arrangement together to a click track with the singer and the guitar player. And I had everybody sitting around and we would basically work through what everyone was going to do. We changed a lot of the parts from the band's original demos and original ideas, so they had, we had to construct parts, and we would do it very quickly on the spot. And then, basically, what we did was we went, we put um, in, and, and again, this was this is always different from project to project. But what mm. worked for me with this one was that I put the outline of the song down with the singer and guitar player, who was a very good guitar player and singer, and and sort of got everything down really quickly to a click. And then I had the drummer play to that and then go through the drum parts with him where we needed to change stuff. And then gradually each instrument I laid in. So while at the end of the day, it sounds sort of a little bit like, I mean, I think somebody at one point coined the phase sausage making where, you know, <laughs> you get nervous about people from the outside seeing the process because, you know, it may seem unnatural to you to work this way. But for me, it's very natural to work that way. Yeah, And, and it's also, you know, Horses for courses too. You 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 know, every single situation is going to be a different way to do things. I think when we did Old Crow, we set everything up and we did everything. Everything was live takes, even though we had everything isolated and separated. It wasn't about building tracks. It was about everybody sort of playing together and hear the interaction of the instruments as it went along. And we we had the ability to change things, and we did. 
but the core of it was live. Whereas a situation like this, because I had limited time, I didn't have the time to be able to do that. So I was basically constructing and steering the tracks and, and, the, and the way that everything would interact as we went along. I mean, maybe in some ways what would be fun would be to do all that, go through that process. And if you had the time, then go, right, now let's all go and record it together. But, right. you know, it's probably unnecessary. It came up pretty good. So. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. I've, I've found that if you've got a band and you can arrange and sort it out with the band together, then it can work to go in and, and focus on each thing and getting it just right afterwards. But um, yeah. all right, so that was that was great. I loved hearing all that. And um, we're going to take a break now. But last thing, uh, you can answer this as quickly as you want. I wanted to say, how did it feel when the Dropkick Murphys going out of style sold 43,000 copies in the first week of being released? Because that sounds, this sounds like a pretty good moment. I think it was, a, yeah, it was a very special moment. And, and I, um, and it feels like an accomplishment, you know, for a band that's, you know, for, for a band like Drop Kicks to, I think we've had, I've done three records with them. They've all gone top 10 and our, and our most recent one, you know, I, I didn't realize they changed the format of the Billboard charts, but I, I think we figured it would have been, had they not changed the format, it would have been number two on Billboard. So we would have got as nice. close as you possibly could to a number one album with them. Um, it's not the most important thing, you know, it, 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 but it is a nice sort of, you know, it's a nice treat. Yeah. You know, I think Al from the band called and said, did you realize it looks like we're going to be, you know, I think we went in the number six on that album. We're going to be number six in Billboard. It, like, it, it, it feels, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a nice thing to hear. And also it lets you know that there's people out there sort of waiting for the music, which is, you know, which is the more important part of it. Yeah. Well, cool. Well, thank you, Ted. And we'll take a break now. We'll come back in and just for a moment for the jam session. Before we do, Rockstars, I want to remind you that you can find links to the stuff we're talking about. I'll include YouTube links to many of Ted's records so you can check them out and go listen to the stuff right in the show notes. rsrockstars.com. Use the little magnifying glass and I just type in Ted and it'll take you right to the blog post. So we'll see you in a moment for the jam session. Roswell Pro Audio brings you microphone design that is out of this world. Endorsed by a growing list of artists and producers like Phil Collin of Def Leppard, Ross Hogarth, who's recorded Van Halen, Ziggy Marley, and the Doobie Brothers, and Supa Dupes, working with Drake, Mary J. Blige, and Eminem. These are all rock stars that have discovered just how great Roswell microphones sound. Check out the Mini K47, which uses a capsule modeled on the one in the vintage U47 at a street price of only $299 or the beautiful Delphos condenser microphone with a capsule tuned like the vintage U67 with great clarity and far lower noise at a street price of only $899. In fact, you are hearing my voice right now on the beautiful Delphos microphone. These mics are carefully crafted by hand and immediately feel good even before you plug them in and hear how great they sound. These are well-built microphones that will last you and your studio a lifetime of great recording. Check out more audio examples of these awesome mics at roswellproaudio.com. Are you having trouble getting your mixes to sound professional? Are you mixing and mastering yourself? Did you know that the vast majority of the world's best mix engineers almost never master their own mixes? So if you're thinking about hiring a professional mastering engineer, check out Chris Graham Mastering. Chris is a billboard chart-breaking mastering engineer who has mastered thousands of songs for both professional and home studio clients just like you. Send one of your songs to Chris and he'll master a sample of your song for free. If you decide to hire him, you can also get a free video mix consultation before mastering to help you get the most out of your mix. To learn more, check out chrisgrammastering.com or just click the link in the show notes. Hey, rock stars! we're back now for the jam session. My guest today is Ted Hutt, joining us on Recording Studio Rockstars. Ted, are you ready to jam? Um, we'll see. All right. <laughs> when you were starting out in music and recording, what was holding you back? Me. <laughs> and why the, did... voice is in, the voice is in my head. 
<laughs> what, did, have what did you do? Did you stand there. stand up <laughs> to yourself as a bully and, and punch yourself in the nose or something? I had a serious word with myself in the mirror. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll take that. I'll take that for sure. Um, now, how about some of the best advice you remember receiving? The best advice? Um, man, I don't know. Um, the best advice? Um, do it like you can't do anything else. Nice. Um, for every moment or particularly just for getting that, the best take in the recording process? <laughs> for, for every moment. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> Give it loads. Yeah. Well, that's, I promise. That's what I'm doing right now. I promise. <laughs> all right, so how about a recording tip, hack, or secret sauce, something the rock stars could use on their next session today? Mm, a recording tip. Make sure it's the right tempo. Good advice. How do you like to make sure it's the right tempo? What are some tricks for? I don't arriving the at the studio. That? Okay. All right. Cool. You and Michael Jackson. Did you put speakers in the ceiling? I'm not quite Michael Jackson, but I have my, I have a go. <laughs> so you're dancing. Um, what tools do you use to capture that tempo and make sure it's right, or measure it rather? Um. Well, I used to use my watch, actually. I, I was really impressed with it. In, in the early days, I worked with the producer, and then we would be we would be playing, and he'd be looking at his watch. And I thought it was because he was figuring out how quickly he could get out of there, but <laughs> it was because he was checking the time. But nowadays, I've got an app on my on my phone, you know, like Time Tap and stuff like that. So that's what I'll do. So wait, so you're you're talking about being ninja enough to look at the second hand moving and sort of yeah. quickly calculate what the BPM yeah. is? Oh, that is hardcore. Yeah, you well, you do it over thirty seconds or a minute, you know, and, and you just just count and the you bars. You get an estimation. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. All right, so now you and what? I'm sorry. What did you say you would use now? Just something on your iPhone or something like that? Yeah, I've got like a couple of little, you know, apps, and I use those, the little time tap apps and things. Yeah. yeah. Have you found that? Like, do you sort of get close and then play the click for them and say, "How's that?" Or do you, yeah. do you try and match no, it up while they're playing before you even show well, it to either them? Either way. Yeah. Sometimes. I mean, you know, sometimes it comes off. A, you know, uh, sometimes it'll come off a demo. Some it'll, sometimes it'll come off. You know, they'll have a song, but I feel like the tempo is wrong and I've got an idea for something different. So I'll shoot it out and have them play to it. And sometimes it's like, just play for a while and feel it out until they feel good. And then I'll, temp and then I'll you know, I'll time tap it. There's yeah. m multiple different ways. And, and also, you know, I will, I will labor on that slightly because, I do, you know, I feel like if I don't have the tempo right, then I'm building on, on an un, you know, on a, not a solid foundation. So I'll do stuff. A bunch of different times too. I'll, let's try one faster. Let's try one more faster, because that way then I'll be like, I, I, that one sounded too fast, and yes. now I know we've gone we've gone past the point now. So I know I, you know, I'm reassuring myself that we're, we've got the right tempo. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of like if tempo was a closet and you were standing it, you have to reach your elbows out and hit the walls and figure out where where everything is. Got to yes, push I the boundaries a, a little. Uh, that's a good analogy. Yeah. Well, that's kind of you to say so. It's kind of a weird analogy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So now how about a, uh, a hardware tool for the studio? Um, obviously, a metronome sounds like one. A watch. Anything else? A metronome. Actually, you know, uh, when I did the first Old Crow record, you know, they, they were they were quite wary of the of the click tracks and the time stuff. And they, they wanted to do everything free form. And, and that wasn't super exciting to me. <laughs> so um, we, what we did was we came up with a compromise where I asked Norm, their manager, if, he'd, if he wouldn't mind running and getting a, um, you know, a, a, a physical metronome, you know, the, the wooden one with oh, the yeah. swinging. And I put it up on top of the, um, you know, the partition and I put, a, you know, put a microphone in front of it. And I went, that's been around for a long time. Let's have a go at playing to that. <laughs> that's <laughs> as old as really your violin, good. as your fiddle. And it totally sold it. Yeah, it was great. Yeah. That's cool. I so. like that idea. Um, I've also enjoyed doing things like, you know, get an old school drum machine and play to that or just. Yeah. Um, yeah. We, once we did a song where we took a guitar and I had him just hit a muted chord, just went chunk like that. And, and we put it into an infinite loop on a delay pedal. Yeah. And that became the click track for the song. And, and it actually stayed in the song because it was stayed, cool. Well, I was going to say that. I mean, it's quite often when you do those things, you end up keeping them. You know, they become an integral part of the track, which is yeah. cool. Yeah. Um, okay. How about a software tool? Something you're excited about or want to share that is share. cool to use? My most used nudge. 
<laughs> nudge in Pro Tools. <laughs> All right. So how do yeah. you like to use nudge? I nudge things about. Um, I, I Well, let me think seriously. Um, I do, but um, a software tool, I don't know really. I mean, I feel like, Hmm. Well, let's talk Everything about nudge. Is, I think uh, nudge is a good yeah, answer. Nudge is, just, yeah, nudge is a good one. But nudge. I think that you know, there's so many things that are very valuable, but but always in you know, in different situations. You know. Well, I mean, like, so for somebody who's not using nudge yet, what are some like literally take an entire bass track and just start pushing it ahead or behind <laughs> the beat and see what it does? I, it's a thing? rabbit hole. You have to be very careful with those things, but it gives you the ability to be able to you know, lean things forward, backwards, times, you know, you've got infinite control with that. Yeah. And and I think you have to be very respectful of that too, because you can make it, you can do a lot of damage with it as well. So Rockstars, so, if you're not using Pro Tools, nudge me is the plus or minus where you can select a region of audio and you can just shift it back in time a little or shift it forward in time and, and you can say how much you want to do it and everything. So great. All right. How about uh, business side of this? What resource, online tool, or advice would you have for somebody who wants to do this for more than just a hobby? Oh, man, that's, I mean, and that comes up because, I'm, you know, people will write and I'll speak to people about that. And I'm, I'm never really sure what advice to give, only follow your heart, you know, and, and involve yourself and sort of, and make incremental steps. Yeah, you know, and stay true to yourself. I mean, you, you know, I think it's a long road, and and I don't think there's, you know, with the exception of a few people, I don't think there are, you know, there are not a lot of things that happen sort of overnight. Yeah, you know, even even overnight stories aren't really overnight stories, right. and and I think, you know, you got to be prepared to just love, live it and love it. As we say in music business, every overnight success is like 10 years of hard work. In the making, yeah. yeah. Well, I think the other thing that I sort of, you know, I succumbed to early on was that, you know, the success is in doing it. You yes. know, the success really to me is just in that I'm able to get up and, and do what I love to do every day, which is sort of sit around making music, playing guitars, doing show. You know, I, you know, if you can if you can look at it that way and just sort of enjoy the process every time, then all the rest of it becomes icing on the cake. And and eventually you will find a way. I think and you do things. Maybe it sounds naive, but I I'm a believer in that if you do things for the right reasons and you do them because your heart's in it, you will find a way to be able to make that pay enough for you to be able to continue doing it. Yeah, and it's probably a lot more enjoyable if you're working on music that you don't hate during that process. Well, I don't know. On it, to be honest with you, I don't know how I don't know how you could do that. Yeah. I mean, I, I certainly look at my own, you know, my own time and I feel like there is no there isn't a way I could have I could have sort of I couldn't do it if I didn't love it. Yeah. And I feel very fortunate in that too that you know each project and each group of people that I work with you know, they become friends. They, you know, it, it, it's a, it's an ever growing sort of world of people around you that you sort of feel a connection to. And that's a, you know, that's a wonderful reward in itself. Yes, I agree. And I also love the fact that sometimes if you didn't realize that you, you know, you didn't know what you thought about the music, you might discover that you really like the people after working with them too. So there's a lot of room to just sort of. There's connections. Grow there. yes, through definitely. the process. You know? Yeah. The message, the people, the, you know, there, there's sort of all elements of the, you know, but it all comes down to making sure that you're in the right place. Yeah. You know, don't, not taking on something you don't have a heart for. Yes, indeed. All right. So now how about um, an organizational tool or, or online thing that you like to use to, that helps you keep all your shit together? That's probably not a good one for me. Um, <laughs> as you've witnessed, I'm not very good at keeping anything together. All right. We'll talk about it from I'm, that perspective. I'm astonished. I'm absolutely astonished that I can keep a, fo a file full of tracks and, and, and takes, and, and I know where everything is, but I can't find my phone charger and I can't. <laughs> and I don't, yeah, I don't know. Organization is not a strong one for me. Um, talk about maybe how you avoid getting frustrated by all the technology and, you know, not feeling derailed by it. Simplify. Okay. I think it's a matter of simplifying. I mean, I think, you know, you don't, you've got sort of so many options. I think, you know, going back to an earlier question where you were talking about sort of the options, I think 
it's a yeah. You know, I mean, that's a great tool. The ability to just go. I need to simplify this. Do you are you somebody that really likes to have a notebook and a pen around as part of your process, as opposed to a phone and <laughs> an do. iPad? <laughs> I'm somebody that likes the idea of having a notebook and pen that never does. Yeah. <laughs> no, I I've actually I, I do I use my phone actually. I do I write a lot of ideas into the notebook area in my mm-hmm. phone and and I do refer to them. Funnily enough, yeah. And another thing I do. You know, when I'm out and about is I'm always, if I hear something, you know, that's this is another thing that I think is important is to stay connected to what it is that you love. So you, if you hear a record or you hear a sound or a song that you like, I, I always note those things. I, may, I have lists in my phone of things that I like, you know, yeah. so I, I'll go and check those out, you know, at, at a time when I'm not in the middle of stuff. Or even sometimes it's really important when you're in the middle of stuff to be able to go, I'm just going to step away from an hour and sort of just check out things that, Maybe I heard when I was driving or while I was waiting for a burrito or, you know, whatever it was. But I heard this song and, or, the, or this sound and it really sort of moved me. And I want to check out what it is because you're always looking for new inspiration and stuff to draw into what you're doing. So last two questions here, and they're both hypothetical, and then we'll wrap up. But the first one is imagine sort of having to start all over and you, you're in a new place. Um, mm-hmm. You need a simple setup to record with. You need to find people to record and you need to make ends meet while you're doing it. Or you're giving this advice to somebody who's about to go through that. What would you choose for a, um, and it doesn't have to be super specific, but something to start out with to record finding people making ends meet. Um, um, all of those things or one at a time, (laughs) one, (laughs) I am, I think you sort of, you have to work with what you've got, whatever you can get. I mean, when I started out, I was very fortunate that there were a lot of people that helped me. So there were situations where somebody had let me have studio time or, you know, I came in as, as a guitar player. So, you know, in the early days I was, you know, I'd watched engineers and producers but I had no real school and I didn't really know what I was doing. And again, you know, I, I asked people for help. I think that that's important and, and sort of, and then also not abusing that, you know, sort of yeah. trying to get, trying to figure out if somebody's willing to help you figuring out how you can sort of pull enough information to keep yourself moving without bugging them every five minutes. Um, and then a lot of it is just sort of through, you know, self is just experimentation yourself and, and, and sort of blazing your own trail really. And having, having confidence that, you know, do things and be, be willing to make all the mistakes and be willing to record things that sound dreadful so that you can go listen to them or ha- have somebody come listen to them with you and explain what you could do to make them maybe sound a little bit more like you want them to. But, but also in doing that, try to make things your own. So you're not, sort of part of this idea of everybody's learning how to do things in a way where we all sort of create in the same sound. Right. You know, it's important to, to, I think it's important to keep the eye on the the personality of things, you know, and, um, and, and sometimes, you know, I, I, I remember reading about the Beatles, you know, how they thought that they, or Elvis, um, John Lennon thought he was Elvis because he put a slap back on his vocal and he thought he looked like Elvis. <laughs> so in, in his mind, he, you know, and, and if you look at that as a study, he's getting it all wrong because he's nothing like Elvis. Right. But, but he's getting it all right because he's John Lennon. So I think that that's an important thing to bear in mind, you know, in our sort of incremental versions of that, that your mistake may be the thing that makes you really unique. So be careful not to get rid of all your, you know, be careful to a, to do things the way that you, you know, I got myself tangled up with no, that. No, it's all I right. Quite now I, th- to finish I think that you sentence, actually, but- I think you sort of unintentionally answered my last question, which was going to be, you know, if you could go back in time and give yourself one bit of advice, what would you say? And it sounds like it'd probably be along those lines, you know, just follow your own path and, and be willing to, to stick it out. Yes. And I think that, you know, the one thing that sort of ties in with all that is, is, is to have confidence. You know, yeah. Where do you get that? <laughs> There's a little store down the road next to the CVS, I think, that sells. It's pretty expensive. <laughs> awesome, man. Well, I know we had some leaping around and stuff, but um, so many great answers, and what a, a pleasure to chat with you and just hear your insights into all this stuff, Ted. 
Um, well, you too. Thank you. Thank you so much for being on Recording Studio Rockstars with us. Let the listeners know how they can find you, follow you, learn more about you. Um, well, I've got a. I've, I've, I've been struggling with the social media stuff, to be honest, because that sort of falls into the organization realm. Right. Um, I have a. I have an Instagram, Ted Hutt. So okay, yeah, I'm, cool. I'm, 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 I can be sort of followed there. Yeah, I mean, if you want, that's another thing, actually. If you want to, if you want to get in touch with people, there's always a way to do it. That's as far as I'll go with that. Yeah, I, I'm rock stars. I'll try and put the link in. There was also a great interview with you and the Gaslight Anthem as you guys were making a record together, sort of black and white video. Do you, you know which one I was referring oh, to? Yeah, that was that was from the Magic Shop. Yeah, from the Magic Shop. So I'll try and drop that it was a link long time into the ago, uh, yeah. into the show notes too, if you want to check that out as well. But um, Rockstars, again, reminder, rsrockstars.com. Go check out the show notes. They're right here on your mobile device. If you're listening right now, you can just click through and you should be able to just click the button. Look for the one that says get full show notes and it'll take you to the blog post with all the YouTube videos and everything. Ted, thank you so much, man. It's a pleasure and I look forward to meeting you in person. Yeah, absolutely. You're based in Nashville, right? Nashville, yeah. Come by anytime. I got a studio here. Yeah. It's ready and waiting when you need if it. I, if, I, if, I, if I get to Nashville on something soon, I'll, I'll definitely call you and we'll give, get a cup of tea or something. All right, sounds great. So, we'll go have some PNG tips. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, some PG tips. PG tips. <laughs> Do you need anything else from me? No, no, that's it. We can just sign off and say goodbye to the rock stars. Okay, we're signing off. All right, cheers, man. Thanks so much, dude. You too. Thank you. Talk soon. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, please leave a rating and review on iTunes to help reach more people. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to recordingstudiorockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And if you want more free content, all you have to do is text RS Rockstars to 33444. Again, that's RS Rockstars to 33444. And I'll keep you in the loop with articles, videos, and podcast updates. And I'll let you know about any upcoming giveaway offers, all totally free. Thanks for listening. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is Recording Studio Rockstars. Now, go make great music.